Hello, everyone. Welcome to Facility Compliance Think Tank presented by Solaris. My name is Lance Wolf, and I'll be your moderator for today's webinar. And this is the second webinar in our three-part series related to navigating the new normal. In keeping with National Healthcare Safety and Security Week, today's topic is security trends within healthcare facilities. This webinar has two purposes. First, we want to discuss the best practices in the areas of facility, life safety, emergency preparedness, security, and other compliance-related topics. And second, this series of webinars was created to help healthcare professionals network together and share ideas. We want to see this network grow. Again, my name is Lance Wolf. I'm the Director of Life Safety Compliance at Solarin. I'm a former Life Safety Code Surveyor for Joint Commission, and I have 17 years of experience in hospitals at the Director, Senior Director level. During that time, I oversaw engineering, emergency preparedness, safety, biomed, and environmental services. Here's today's speaker lineup. First, we have Robert Wilsman. Robert's the Director of Security and Safety and Emergency Management at University of Missouri Healthcare. Rob has over 20 years of experience in healthcare industry, and he's a member of our facility compliance think tank. Rob served as the chair of Missouri Region F Emergency Healthcare Coalition, Coalition for five years, and he trained at FEMA Center for Domestic Par Preparedness. Rob also is a member of International Association of Healthcare Safety and Security, and he's a certified healthcare emergency professional. Rob has a bachelor in fine arts from Truman State University, and he also has a master's of science in management and leadership from Western Governors University. After Rob, we have Buck Dykes. Buck is a chief security canine consultant at Sentinel Canine Training Institute. Buck has over 30 years, 33 years of experience in the military, law enforcement, and security ta tactics and operations. Buck provided security canine services internationally as a Department of Defense and NATO contractor serving in both Iraq and Afghanistan. Buck served as a police canine handler, police canine trailer, trainer, canine evaluator, police canine unit sergeant commander, international provider, owner, and executive administrator, and, many, and author of many canine art articles. Buck holds an advanced supervisory and special certificates for law enforcement certified by the state of California post standards. Buck's a graduate of Law Enforcement Post Sherman Block Supervisory Leadership Institute. He's a certified Six Sigma Black Belt, and he's also a certified instructor in civilian response to active shooter events. Well, we appreciate all of our speakers taking their time out today to provide us with their knowledge on this topic, and I'm sure it's going to be informative for everyone here. I have a couple of high housekeeping items. One, each panelist is going to have about 10 to 15 minutes utilizing PowerPoint slides, so take screenshots and feel free to use this webinar as a reference. Like we said, we want this network to grow, and this is for you. After our speakers are presented, we're going to have about 10 minutes for a live Q&A session. So please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to ask the questions. Don't use the chat, specifically use the Q&A button. And if your toolbar disappears, just scroll your mouse over it and it's going to reappear. And on one of the last slides of the presentation, we're going to have FCTT's web address on it. So you can utilize the site to help you network in the future as well. And as information on Solarin's facility compliance software that may be of interest to you regarding this presentation. Well, let's get started on the webinar. And first, I'm going to kick it off by giving you a few minutes of a surveyor's perspective of security trends within healthcare facilities. Next slide, please. So let's talk about some of the security stigmas and some of the statements that I've specifically heard of, you know, of the past. And some of those statements, one is administration and security is a, a necessary evil because they're not income producing. So, so they looked at it as, you know, keep that force as lean as possible. Um, also, I've heard people say security is not important because they're not focused on during accreditation survey, which that's gonna change. And I'll talk about that here in a couple more slides. Another stigma is security is not adequately trained, so they're not utilized. Um, I've heard statements say that if something happens, I'm not calling security. Another stigma is security is not energetic. Um, also, security staffs hired just because they had a pulse, and I specifically have heard that as well. And then the last is low wages equals reduced intellectual level, meaning that the low wages is you're not going to get somebody that comes in that specifically has you know any further education. It comes for, you know you might have retired law enforcement if you're if you know you're lucky when you come in, but in general, um, you know it comes back to because they had a pulse. And next slide, please. So here's some of the issues within security forces within healthcare. And keep in mind, you're going to hear these general themes throughout this whole presentation between Rob and Buck as well. 
But you know, some of the issues are one, we have reduced wages, so it limits the exterior applications. You don't get a lot of applications for people that want to come in and work within security. Uh, also, lack of training. Uh, additionally, you have staff turnover. Staff will come in, they'll start working for security, and they'll transfer out to other departments within the healthcare area, facility. Um, they also have minimal tools used while on duty due to litigation matters. You know, hospitals, they decide, you know, what tools they're going to use and what risks they're willing to take. Some hospitals are very proactive, other hospitals are not. Um, also, you have staff treated with less respect than other healthcare workers. Um, you know, that comes back to the statement that was made on the prior slide is that, you know, they feel that security is a necessary evil and they're not part of the facility. Uh, also, security is overutilized to watch mental patients. This is a huge problem right now within facilities, and I see this across the nation, is you're utilizing your security to watch the mental patients, and then it, and what's happening is you're actually creating a risk with your facility because your security is not actually allowed to do the job that they're supposed to be doing. And then also, security staff is not adequate for the size of the facility. It comes back to, you know, they're not income producing, so they run as being lean. Next slide, please. So let's talk about some of the electronic trends within security. Well, these are some things that are, we're seeing right now and in the future, we're, you know, you'll see facilities going this direction if they haven't been doing it as well. Uh, one, you know, we're coming out with rounding pins. Um, and this is where they go around and they're scanning areas to make sure that they're doing their security patrols around the facility. Uh, also, you're seeing increased camera coverage to help supplement offers, offers, officers because you have that area you know, where you're running lean so, you know, certain facilities are adding additional camera coverage to help, you know, in putting an individual in front of it to be able to see more areas. Also, camera technology is increasing. And what's nice about this is as it's increasing, the cost of technology is re reducing. So you're able to get more camera coverage out there because the costs are, are, are decreasing. Uh, also, body cams. And I know Rob's going to talk about this as well. He has experience specifically with this. And um, so I'll let him get into that area more. And then last is electronic reporting, software programs. There are software programs out there now that are helping uh, security forces become more efficient. So Laren, we have a program uh, that, you know, that we uh, use well for facility and talk about that towards the end of this presentation. Next slide, please. So let's talk about some additional tools utilized by security forces. This is not everywhere, but this is some of the, some of the facilities I have seen this at each facility um, you know, throughout the nation is one, you're starting to see an increase in tasers. Uh, you have chemically re, you know, induced behaviors. And so that's gonna have to be met with a certain amount of you know, force to be able to control individuals and, and specifically you know, to make sure that you're creating the safest environment for staff and for your security officers and for your patients. Uh, also pepper spray, pepper spray is pretty common. Um, additionally, you're, you have canine officers on staff and this is a future trend. And this is an area that Buck's gonna talk about as well and get deeper into this subject. Uh, you're also seeing an increase in armed units. Some security forces now are going beyond the tasers now, and now they're becoming armed. And, uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about armed on the next slide. Uh, ASP and other soft and hard targets striking, striking batons, those are pretty common, but there are certain facilities that don't even have that yet. Uh, this one here is um, a huge focus right now within facilities, and that's diffusion techniques for behavioral health. Because of those chemically induced behaviors, uh, it's becoming a huge focus with your security staff and your, your staff up on the floors uh, to be able to learn these diffusion techniques to help diffuse any type of crisis specifically related to behavioral health. And then also you're having increased defensive tactics. Uh, the training now is starting, that's starting to be a trend. Um, you know, defensive tactics were just kind of looked upon as a quick you know, class, but now they're actually getting to the point where they're sending their security forces out and they're going through week long you know, defensive tactics courses. Next slide, please. So how are the trends affecting accreditation surveys? Well, this is the biggest key, and this is a common thing that you hear on multiple of these webinars, is document, document, document. You cannot document enough, specifically with security, if you have armed units and you're utilizing tools, because you know the key is, is during surveys, prepare for your training is going to be scrutinized. If it, when I was out uh, surveying, if I came across a facility that was armed, that was the first thing I asked for was the policy and their training documentation to make sure that they're they're doing what their policy says and they're training to what they state. Um, you know, certain states have certain uh, regulations, so that's going to vary between the states. But in general, the policy is going to what is going to be the area that's focused on specifically during the survey. 
Um, and, so, and also too, if you have canine officers on staff, the policy and training is gonna be reviewed on that. And Buck's gonna talk a little bit more about that as well. Um, so some of the security trends that, that we talked about, you know, is gonna be talked about based upon the geographical area. For example, if you're in a rural area and you don't have any type of inner city issues, um, you, you know, you're going to have different security trends than if you're in, in an inner city, especially if you're in an area that has a large gang population. And then last, you know, the response to COVID is related to facility shutdown. And Rob's going to speak about this more, but specifically with COVID, what's happened with security is now they're limiting ingress into the facility. And I don't foresee that changing. Um, you know, hospitals were pretty, you know, open to, to the public. You get in multiple areas. And one th area that I see now is they're limiting that, that ingress or coming into the facility, and that's going to stay. Uh, next slide, please. So let's talk about some more future trends. One is you're going to see an increase in training requirements. And this is, like I said, based upon your chemical-related behaviors. You're going to see an increase in professionalism because that's going to be a requirement now. You know, going in and it has it's already become a requirement, but you're going to see that trend continue. Um, also, you're going to have an increased training in emergency response, specifically with COVID. With COVID, it, with security, security started, you know, becoming directly involved with it. And so that's going to be a future trend now, specifically with emergency preparedness. So, you know, look for those areas when you're getting surveyed. Um, also, cybersecurity is going to be another area that's going to be coming out, specifically with emergency preparedness in 2022 with Joint Commission. Joint Commission, cybersecurity is actually going to become an element of performance. So start working with your IT, get your security involved to make sure that everybody understands what they knew, need to do and what their role is specifically with cybersecurity. Um, you're going to also have training in other areas of healthcare related to safety and engineering. With COVID, security started being, you know, having other duties assigned to them whether it be, you know, during rounding, they were checking fire extinguishers, uh, they were doing the point where I've even heard where security has even checked filters in certain areas. But keep in mind, that's a very fine line because you wanna make sure you're allowing your security staff to be able to do their patrols properly, properly and be able to respond to any type of situations. And then last, and this is, you know, unfortunately, this is a future trend, is handcuffs and flashlights are no longer gonna become the normal. So expect with your security force, you're going to increase your training, you're going to increase the tools being utilized uh, because it's going to become the new standard and it's based on the demands from the hospital staff or geographical trends. You know, it's because of chemical related behaviors, you know, behavior health issues, um, you know, facilities are being forced to be able to utilize more with their security staff. Next slide. And that's all I have. So now we're going to go ahead and we're going to move over to Rob and Rob's going to talk about current trends that's specifically happening within healthcare since Rob is dealing with it every day. So Rob, you there? Hey Lance. Okay, we'll take it away. <laughs> All right, so uh, first off, I wanna say uh, happy uh, healthcare safety and security week to every, uh, all the security professionals out there um, and uh, yeah, jump right in there. So if we're gonna talk about um, future trends and in, uh, in, uh, security, um, we gotta kind of start with the here and now. So um, next slide if you can. Um, and, and the here and now is, is the impacts that are happening with the COVID-19 um, uh, pandemic. And, and so, you know, the, the reality is, is out of this pandemic, we've gotten some both positive and some negative, in, in, believe it or not. And so from the negative kind of side of things, we really understand, got to understand the mental health impacts that have kind of hit us all. We're all dealing with this, everybody, every single person, um, both our staff and the public. And the, the rise of those mental health things are coming into our, our hospital facilities. And it's not just our emergency departments that's seeing that. Um, it's our behavioral health units, but it's every care unit, it's every space, everywhere. And our security professionals are having to deal with that on a regular basis. And, and how are our officers being prepared to deal with that? What other types of tools, resources do we need to have them uh, provided so that they're ready and, and prepared to deal with that? And understand that they too are also living in this environment and dealing with the, the reality of COVID and, and the impacts of their family, their friends, their loved ones as they're, they're living it as well. So it's a, it's a real, reality that we live in. Um, so what training, what type of tools do we need to give for them? Um, you know, COVID changed a lot of things for us um, and, and, the, and the impact that it brought to us. Whenever the changes came about with, you know, restricting the, the entry points and the access, we kept changing the rules. The rules kept changing. The, the 
Um, persons uh, were not allowed to come in, the restricted access, you know, one visitor, no visitors, two visitors. When could, you know, and, and when the public didn't know what was going on, uh, the rules kept changing. Our officers didn't know. It was hard to change the enforcement of what was going on, and, and that became problematic. The families didn't know how they can get to their loved ones. The, the caregivers didn't understand it at times, and it became problematic. And so that stressful, that time, it had impacts. It had impacts on the environment. It had impacts in the way we were able to provide care. In the, and so that was a stressful time. It changed the way we dealt with things. The, the, the tendency for aggression moved from the care environment at times to the front door. Um, and so whenever there's that uncertainty, we had to deal with that. Um, and so we had to show times of empathy and understanding that, yes, the, you know, you want to be with your loved one, we can't do it. There was technology, there was, we used a lot more of FaceTime and different tablets and things. Security played a different role, different types of ways to do things differently, times of, um, different types of ways to uh, get involved. Um, to deal with that frustration, that social distancing caused that anxiety and that stress that, that, that came about. And so we dealt with that times of crisis. Um, those impacts of those visitors, it was difficult. It was hard on all of us at that time. A lot of facilities dealt with the, the, the differences in COVID differently. Officers got involved in doing temperature screens in some locations, were asked to step in and stand at the door, do the screening that was required by CMS and others, and do outside, step outside of their normal roles and be more involved in that. We had some positive impacts. We actually got to control the entry points, got to change the way in which we were restricting our access points. And what my main facility on my main campus, we had 46 entry points into our facility that we really had no limitations. We are now at four public entry points and four uh, access controlled uh, staff entry points. And I hope to maintain that moving forward. It's my, my goal. And you know we were able to take that positive impact and move forward. Vendor management, identifying the vendors and who they're, com who they're coming to see and how they're coming into the organization and you know, identifying them and managing that, identifying all those different aspects. And through the process of COVID, we were able to start understanding the way materials were moving through the organization. We started having to quarantine and hold PPE back and pull PAR levels back because things were disappearing. That was a negative, but through that process of it made it into a positive and understanding how we manage our vendors, how we manage some product. And so we made those positive impacts that we can sustain and so securing those assets and then understanding how those people move through our organization. Next slide. So when the, with that controlling that our facilities a little better, then now we have some better access control. We have better understanding of our facilities, a better understanding of how we're maintaining those facilities. Something maybe we can hopefully move forward and control um, on a longer term. And so those staff controlled access points. Can we do things better? Can we put better measures in place? Um, you know, understanding those those locations with uh, electronic access controls, uh, understanding those visitor control points. Um, well, uh, do we have opportunities for weapons detection now? Um, do we have other screening opportunities that are besides just temperature controls? Um, can we assess those locations? Do some mitigation tools, uh, location uh, assessments there. Um, with that vendor management, is there other opportunities there at our loading docks that are other things? Looking at that, using all this opportunities now with our facilities, with our access control, now we've had this, this access um, you know, opportunity to better utilize our, our, our environment. Um, I encourage you to look at NFPA 730, the Guide to Premises Security. Um, it's not a guideline that is surveyable under most organizations. Joint Commission does not survey to it. Um, it's not a CMS uh, referred to guideline. My organization is a DMV uh, surveyed uh, organization. It's something that DMV does refer to. Um, and it's, you know, but it's, like I said, it's not something that a lot of organizations are going to be surveyed to, but as a guideline, as a best practice, it's something that is an organization, take a look at it. It's something that you may find uh, uh, some tools, some resources, how you can best um, harden your facility and have a, a greater uh, access control elements. Um, next slide, please. 
So when you're looking at hardening your, your facilities and looking at what you can do to make things stronger and better, a security vulnerability assessment is a, is a, is a strong tool. Um, and so if you look at NFPA 99, uh, the 2012 edition, chapter 13. Now this is another uh, standard that is not surveyable per CMS or uh, Joint Commission is not gonna survey that. Again, uh, DNB does survey chapter 13. Um, and if you're looking at the SBA, an SBA is a, is, a, is a tool that you're, you know, security vulnerability assessment where you're going to assess your facility, you're looking to assess your areas, you're going to evaluate your potential security risk, your potential, your physical and operational environment, and your, your facility uh, and, all the, and all the persons that are within. On the screen there is our matrix that we utilize in my organization um, where we're looking at your probabilities and your severity and you're rating your hazards. Next slide. Um, we, we use a, a, a software tool, um, it's a Solarium product, um, that we, we look at our, um, we put all of our SBAs into, and we do a deep dive, and we look at the physical environment, and we're assessing each location, and we're determining what are our hazards, what are our, our vulnerabilities, uh, what are our risks, what, what are those risks, what are those impacts in that space. Uh, what are the specific deficiencies? What are issues? What are the concerns? We're looking at, you know, both at personnel, we're looking at assets, we're looking at all the different aspects, and then determining what can we mitigate out as risk, what other measures and, and resources can we bring in and harden and make it in place and make things more secure. Um, make improve, uh, what improvements can we put in place? So um, improvement items are then derived, they're designated, and then the, the, any, if there's needed assets or environmental controls can be put in place, training needs are brought forward, other measures, um, that's all the derived, it's scored out, it's put onto a, a, a methodology, and then it's sent forward to the appropriate stakeholders. Um, giving them the opportunity to regress and determine what um, to, when to, to move it on to the next level and address those items. Next slide. Um, so here's some examples of some of the things as we would identify, you know, uh, as some different uh, categories of different issues. Um, you know, and we categorize those out as uh, things that we shall do. Um, they're, they're things would get categorized as. Um, Things are a deficiency is a shall or a should or a may, um, and then we you know we'll determine you know what type of issue or concern and move those forward into the, the stakeholder to move them on. Next slide. So one of the things that we've recognized, you know, and a trend that is unfortunately been noticed noticed in in the healthcare environment is is violence. Um, violence is something that's been perpetuated and been going on, unfortunately, uh, within healthcare. And workplace violence is a, a concern that we need to get ahead of. Um, you know, rec you know, one of the key elements is getting staff to understand and recognize the perpetuance of violence. Well, one thing that we've been proponent of here in my organization is development of behavioral health plans. Um, whenever you have a patient that has been dealing with, has a propensity for violence uh, and, and demonstrated violence previously, identifying them, putting a note in their medical record, putting some kind of a flag in there so that when the person comes back in again, there's a notification to security. So the security is involved and engaged and we are prepared for when they come in and we can have that dialogue with them, have that expectation setting for them that this behavior is not tolerated. There's personal responsibility to the caregiver to know and understand that you need to report this every single time. Violence is not tolerated in healthcare. We need to deal with this. We got to get ahead of this. We got to get on top of it. Report, report, report. Tell those caregivers, report violence every time, anytime, every time that it happens. Sexual misconduct, hateful, hurtful words, physical violence, all of that is important. It has to be reported every time. Bringing de-escalation training out to the caregivers, giving them the tools, the resources, the skills to be able to identify the perpetuance and the, the, the indications of violence and aggression before it starts so that they can de-escalate it before it ever gets to the point of any type of harm of physical interventions necessary so that they can determine that. And then if we have to have some type of a response, what kind of response teams do we have? It's not just a security response. 
a clinical team must be engaged. That clinical environment, it, the clinicians involved and part of that response team and part of that activity because it's a clinical environment, it's a clinical interaction. And how do we get those people involved? How do we keep them involved and engaged? And it's a key part. Security is an educator. We are, we are helping these clinicians be stronger and better at identifying violence and addressing the violence. And it's the only way we're going to deal with workplace violence. I strongly encourage everybody, look at the OSHA publication 3148-04R, the guideline to preventing workplace violence in healthcare and social workers. This is the tool that's going to help you build a strong workplace violence program and help you enhance your program. Utilize that tool. It's going to make your program better. It's going to help you be stronger. One of the things that we've identified and one of the things that we've, we've done to help our workplace violence program is we're now outfitting all of our officers with body cameras. And the body cameras is a tool that we're putting in place and it's a deterrent in and of itself. The simple presence of a body camera as an officer arrives on scene, it then is, is brings the awareness to, to, to the individual acting out as, I cannot, I cannot act a fool and deny that I acted the fool because I'm recorded audio and visual. Next slide. I really appreciate your time. And if you have any questions or comments, I'd really like to have a dialogue and, and share any questions, concerns with anybody. Great, thank you, Rob. Yeah, that was great information. And um, and you're right, I know specifically with the accrediting agencies, uh, you know, the Joint Commission is not surveying to it, but that is an area that I foresee that it, they're going to start surveying to it in the future. They're already surveying it to a certain point, specifically with the tools. But uh, but yeah, thank you again for for the great information. All right, thank you. So now we're going to go head over to Buck, and Buck's going to talk about lean security forces and you know maximizing your your protection throughout your facilities. So Buck, are you there? Yes, sir. All right. Well, take it away. All right. Hey, thanks for having me. I'm really excited today to be talking to you guys about maintaining the proper level of protection. I want to ask a question. How many of you uh, that are participating today know that you lack in a certain area of protection in your facilities? Um, that, that area due to budget cuts or uh, even cuts in personnel um, is, is not currently being uh, protected at the proper level or the level as uh, required by policies or uh, you know, federal government regulations. Those are the areas that you need to concentrate on. The thought of you know, um, uh, you know, being lucky or hoping that something doesn't happen in those areas, usually uh, Murphy's Law, that's where you actually have a mishap or an issue. And now you're having to answer for uh, not providing the current levels in a court of law, which we all know uh, creates huge loss. So um, next slide, next slide, please. The areas that I'd like to talk to you today uh, are specific security challenges. And, and Rob and Lance have, have talked about this as well. Um, you have specific challenges within your organization. Uh, they're not a global issue. Uh, they're not trending in, like Lance said, the metropolitan areas uh, if you're a rural facility. So I wanna talk about those briefly. Uh, security is ever changing. It's a breathing, living mechanism. And uh, we need to look at that as, as trends change in our specific organization and as you know the threat levels increase then obviously we need to make changes uh, pitfalls and negligence leads to loss okay so uh, back to my first question if you know there's areas in your facility that are not being properly protected um, and you have that knowledge then when something does happen and you're you're called in to testify in the court of law uh, you know, having that knowledge is going to be a huge problem for you. And then I'm going to introduce you the the uh, canine options that are now becoming more and more prevalent in the healthcare industry. Next slide. Okay, current state provides ample reasons for security teams to be heavily involved on site. Specific types of reoccurring incidents provide more reasons. Okay, so we need to look at what's trending in our facility. Lance brought it up. If you have a facility that's in a, a heavy gang area, then obviously you're going to need to uh, put some resources into those areas where a, a rural facility may not have that. Your biggest problem or loss or injuries may be related to like say slip and falls or something to that effect. 
Um, so more, uh, you know, less of the criminal element and more on just the normal everyday procedures, house cleaning, uh, housekeeping that uh, maybe uh, need to be more focused on. Um, and, and also that, that, that posturing or that, that culture that we establish in our facilities, having those security uh, personnel available and visible, having them making their rounds. Um, you know, the, the, the security protocols can discourage disorderly conduct. Uh, it can also empower staff. There was an article that was uh, recently uh, uh, presented by NBC on the 11th of this month where uh, uh, healthcare workers were concerned about, are you gonna protect us? Unfortunately with COVID, the assaults we're starting to see are more emotional than they were in the past, simply because we're preventing loved ones and family members from being able to go in and see their, their, their sick family members or loved ones. And that's creating an emotional effect. Um, and sometimes violence and anger is, is, is uh, brought out by, by having to uh, refuse these people access to their loved ones. And this is something that we're having to make uh, adjustments to. You know, an emotional response, um, you know, especially when it comes to violence, it can be uh, much more of a problem for us than in the past. So prevention begins with understanding your individual environment, your individual facilities and, and you know, where, where your threat levels are and um, where you need to concentrate. And, you know, that, that's, that's very important. You don't want to have a, a, an overabundance of security. Um, to where you're, you're creating waste by having too many resources in one area versus not having enough because, you know, your budget cuts have, have now required you to pretty much cut out a lot of your security and you're only providing, uh, you know, minimum security coverage in certain areas. Next slide, please. Okay, an increase in violence. You know, I talked about the uh, emotional side of things now with COVID. Uh, you know, it, it just put yourself in that person's shoes. You have a person with no criminal history, um, you know, no real history of violence. They've come to see their, their loved one, wife, mother, child, whatever the case is, and they're denied access to these people. Again, an emotional response. OSHA reports the rate of serious workplace violence incidents. Those that result in days off to, uh, to recuperate is more than four times greater in the healthcare industry and in the private industry on average. Uh, second to law enforcement. If you think about it, our law enforcement professionals are going out on a daily basis and they're looking for crime, they're looking for criminals. That's what they do. Uh, and and the, this, the, uh, the assaults occur in that profession. Uh, the next profession on the list is the healthcare industry. And uh, you know, that's where our security element is in place. And that's where we have to have the right tools, the right resources and the right training to, to combat those areas and provide that level of security for our workplace uh, personnel or our healthcare professionals. So they feel safe at work and they can come in and do their job properly. Number two, obviously uh, is discussed is the abduction and abuse. You know the abduction of infants and the, you know the abuse of the elderly. You know we need to keep that in uh, in our in our uh, plan as well on how we're going to uh, ensure that those areas are covered. And then just straight theft. I mean you have supplies, you have merchandise, you have uh, like I said medical supplies, uh, your food stores. You know we need to remember that anyone with access to those areas can create loss, can take things. Okay, so. Um, you know, uh, making sure that those areas are covered to protect us from that, that added loss is obviously uh, one, of our, one of our responsibilities that need to, we need to maintain and look at. Okay, next slide. Doing more with less, budget cuts, okay? Uh, you know, cutting, cutting someone's budget, uh, working internationally as a provider for security resources in Afghanistan and Iraq, a lot of times I would work on uh, requests for proposals and responding to those requests. And I've seen where a lot of times uh, a request for proposal would come out and they would ask for a certain number of armed security officers, a certain number of canine resources. And then a couple of weeks later, we would get a, a, uh, a notice that those resources had been cut. And usually between 25 and 35% 
And the first area that, that they start looking at to cut is our security. And, uh, you know, that, that in our world today is really not a good idea. You know, we as security professionals have talked about, well, well, we'll have visual deterrence in place or psychological deterrence in place. Well, you know, in the past that, that was successful for us, but now more and more we're seeing that those areas are being challenged. And if we're weak in those areas, then we've got ourselves a huge problem. So uh, requirements to cut costs is one of the most devastating restraints to an effective security program. If you don't have the money to do your job and provide the proper protection, obviously that creates great problems. And um, you know, our, our shareholders need to understand and know that. You know, part of that education uh, on our part, you know, we need to go in and educate these folks that they control the finances on, hey, you know, up front, we may go, you know, the, for the next year without those resources and uh, not have any issues. But then when that incident does occur, and now we're uh, facing legal litigation and, you know, we're, we're, we're being called into court, uh, the, the money that we're going to lose through a judgment against us is going to be a lot more money than just uh, not having these resources available. And then looking at technology, uh, you know, technology is, is the, the wave of the future as it comes to security. I think we're all realizing that with the uh, added technology that, you know, I was in law enforcement. Uh, we didn't have anything near what they have today with the, you know, in-car dash cameras and the body cams and, you know, a, a lot of these resources that they have available today. It just wasn't present. Well, uh, it's present now, and so we may have operated like that in the past, but, uh, you know, we need to keep up with the technology. Also, let me mention, uh, you know, briefly that with the lack of budgets for our law enforcement professionals and, um, you know, uh, the, the, the resources that they're asked to, uh, to expend on a daily basis where they have short staff and, you know, low pay, uh, the security industry is going to be called upon more and more as we go forward to take on some of those law enforcement responsibilities that will be no longer uh, available, will be no longer available to us by our law enforcement community. So those responsibilities are being um, pushed into, you know, our on-site security professionals. And, you know, we're going to have to step up to the plate and, uh, you know, really um, pay attention to you know, what our, what our priorities are. Okay, next slide. Okay, so with all of that said, we need to consider our losses. You know, if we're negligent or we fail to provide in, in areas of security and we know that we're lacking in those areas, then we need to make adjustments accordingly to our, to our uh, uh, areas that we're not uh, protecting. Uh, you know, a judgment against us for being at fault or being negligent failure to train, failure to supervise. You know, these are all areas that we need to, to look at um, very closely because it's gonna create, create much more loss for us than having those processes in place. Next slide. Okay, finally, introduction to the canine option. There is a lot of uh, healthcare facilities now that are considering the canine option. Um, obviously the canine option is not uh, the right fit for every facility. Um, you know, you have to pick the right dog, number one. Uh, it's just not every dog out there that's a German Shepherd or Belgian Malinois or in the working dog uh, class is able to do these jobs. Uh, you know, it's, it's usually about one in 100 dogs when we get out there and start doing the testing, they have to have the right temperament. You don't want a dog to enter a healthcare environment and, you know, bite someone. Um, so the, the selection process, the handler, uh, you know, uh, you can't be someone that has no dog handling experience. We got to get an experienced handler. And then the ongoing training. Swig Dog International requirements for training a dog is 16 hours of maintenance training per month. And uh, a lot of hospitals and healthcare facilities are using dogs uh, very successfully in de escalating, uh, you know, violence and, and calming things down. Um, so it is an option that you could look at. It's not a cheap option. It's uh, you know, rather expensive, especially the beginning of the startup, but it is an option that is available. So I appreciate your time today. That's all I have. And uh, should you have any questions, please, uh, please let me know. Thank you very much.
Great, thank you, Buck. And uh, we really appreciate too the canine uh, aspect. I, like you said, I know it's not a lot of facilities, but that is a future trend. And so we really appreciate the time you took out to, uh, you know, out of it today to you know be able to give us a little bit more insight on that. Thanks for having me. Okay. All right. Well, uh, we're going to be right back with our Q and A time after this. Hello, everyone. This is Grady with Solarin. I just wanted to pop in and say thanks so much for attending today's webinar. And I wanted to briefly introduce you to Solarin and ICM. Solarin has been developing software solutions since 2004. We've dedicated ourselves to developing an intuitive set of solutions specifically for healthcare facilities. We've also developed the market's only true ICM platform. ICM stands for Integrated Compliance Management. So what is integrated compliance management? Well, ICMs are generally comprised of multiple solutions designed to work seamlessly together within one platform. There's literally hundreds of systems and processes across multiple departments used to manage healthcare facilities. ICM is simply taking all of those solutions across all departments and putting them all in one integrated platform. Doing this allows you to store all of your information in one place with one single point of entry, and ICM helps you enforce your best practices with less overall administration, easier training since there's only one interface to learn, and more importantly, it can actually do work for you. Having all this information in one place gives you better visibility, trending, and analytics across your entire system. Solarin's ICM consists of six individual suites that include work orders, rounding, permitting, vendor management, project management, and security management. Each ICM suite consists of five to eight different applications that can be used individually, but you're gonna see the most benefit when it's used as part of an entire suite. Of course, ICM's unique benefit comes when using multiple suites across the entire platform. Bringing this information together in one place across all departments gives you better visibility in what you've been able to achieve before across the entire hospital or even your entire healthcare system. When your data starts working together across an ICM platform, you'll be able to better visualize your data using new tools like the regulatory survey dashboard or the fully integrated life safety plan manager. I know I went through this really quick and at a really high level, but I just wanted to introduce you to Solarin, ICM, and these tools that will ensure that you're ready for your next survey. If you'd like to learn more, contact us at solarin.com anytime. We really appreciate you attending the webinar today and hope it's informative and useful for you to manage your facility better. Lance, back to you. Thanks, Grady, and thank you again for covering that information as well. You know, with Solarian, like, like we talked about, we've got a lot of tools that I, you know, I think uh, definitely benefit uh, facilities across the nation, and some facilities, as is Rob, they're already utilizing our tools and they're very happy with it. Um, you know, it helps you do more with less, as we talked about, which being efficient is kind of a, an overall theme, you know, with this webinar. Um, so now we're going to go ahead and turn to Q&A. And uh, we've covered a lot of information, but we're going to open up for Q&A questions, which I see we already have some in the queue. Uh, so let's go ahead and start with that. Um, and first, we're going to, I think, Rob, I think this question here will probably benefit. You'll be be uh, the one that's uh, be able to handle this the best. And uh, the question is, is uh, if your annual survey analysis shows multiple areas that's considered uh, security deficient, how do you recommend approaching the C-suite? with the recommendations to help minimize the risk for the facility? So uh, the, the key thing is, is when we, we do that analysis, we, we categorize it, like I said, into the, the shall, should, and may. And those shall items are those regulatory items that, that are a mandatory requirement that imposes an obligation to act or a necessity to act, that there's some, it, it's a, a loss of life or limb if we don't, it's a, it's a requirement, there's, there's a, there's a code issue and those they there's not really an option not to. Um, there's no county option to say, nope, we're not going to. Um, so, you know, we've got to find the funds, we've got to find the means, the measures. 
Um, so that, those, those get prioritized, those get organized, and we find a way forward. Um, the, the shoulds and the mays, um, then we got to find other prioritizations. And, you know, there's not a, there's no money tree. There's, there's finite resources. And, and so um, how do we find the ways to, to go forward and how do we do that? And so prioritization a lot of times comes down to um, the, at the director level, at the, the departmental level, um, at the C-suite, you know, we're working directly with the you know, entity, um, you know, is this a clinic? Is this a, a, a hospital department? Is it a, the, the entire hospital facility? Um, what is the what is the threat? What is the hazard? What, what are we trying to mitigate? And so there's a lot of factors when we categorize and risk that out and, and we determine it. But um, so the first comes down to is, is it a should, a shall? Uh, is it a should or a may? Is it a, or is it a shall? Um, and then we go from there. Okay, great. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Rob. Um, and uh, you, you know, you're right. Um, you know, there's many areas that you know there is becoming a focus with security. You know, specifically with the trends as you talked about. Um, so, okay, we'll go to our next question here. And uh, Buck, this one's specifically for you. It's uh, regarding canine usage. So the question is, uh, you mentioned an increase in canine usage within healthcare, but the, the question is, what are your suggestions for setting up a program within a healthcare facility? Well, my first thing would be to actually do a, an assessment and see if the uh, you know, canine would be a necessary and uh, uh, valuable resource or your, you know, your, your current security plan. Um, canine is not in any way a, a, a cost-saving uh, option. Uh, it actually uh, is very costly, especially for your first year. And then going forward, just the training requirements uh, is, is, is uh, you know, hard to keep up with. Sometimes uh, it requires overtime pay. And then also, you know, where are we gonna house this dog? Uh, the, the daily upkeep, food, medical bills, um, the monthly medications. Um, so it's, it's not something that, you know, you need to look at as a cost savings, but is absolutely a, a force multiplier, uh, you know, with the idea of doing more with less. And some of the hospitals are actually utilizing the dog not only as a, as a psychological deterrent, uh, just with the dog being present, but they're also using them as a dual purpose uh, resource store. They're using the dogs to be able to detect some of the bacterias that hospitals and healthcare providers look for, be able to detect the presence of those uh, bacterias. And uh, this is this is found to be more cost effective than actually taking tests and sending it off to a lab to have it tested and confirmed. Uh, dogs can actually confirm that just by the detection and proper training. So, um, you know, First off, seeing if that resource is necessary, and then you know moving forward is uh, what I would suggest. Okay, great. All right. Um, oh yeah. Well, and, and thanks, uh, Buck. You know, specifically with the, with the canine aspect. You know, that is a very specialized area, and you know, we're we're definitely happy to have you on the webinar today because you know, really, um, there's a lot of misinformation out. You know, specifically with canine usage. So we'll go on to our next question, and I believe, yeah, I'll, I'll take this one here. And the question is, is if your security force is armed, what specifically does your survey look for during the survey? And I alluded with this and talked about it a little bit with my presentation at the start, but specifically, you know, the areas you have to focus on if you have an armed force is specifically your documentation and your training. You want to make sure that you're following to a T what your policy says. And also too, you know, check with your state. Like I said, multiple states have different guidelines. Certain states require annual, you know, an annual qualification specifically with armed, you know, forces. And that's across the board. Doesn't matter if it's in healthcare, doesn't matter if it's law enforcement, doesn't matter if it's private. So, you know, check your state regulations, check your policy. What I recommend is do absolute is do up and above of what the regulations are. You know, always quickly security force because that's going to also help minimize litigation in the future if you have any incidents. So we got a couple more questions here. Um, the next one is, uh, Rob, I, I think you'll be best for this one here. Um, and the question is, is uh, what, what do you see with both patient and staff screening for weapons? Or the mute button. I think this is the first time using Zoom. Uh, <laughs> So, you know, weapon screening, you know, there's just, it, it's, it's a, it's a tool that is, is getting more and more prevalence. And so 
and 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 staff screening and all that. So you know, we, card access for staff screening and the, all the different t technology. There's been a lot of different resources, a lot of different technology out there. There's been, you know, the temperature screening and different things, and people have tried a lot of different stuff. And and honestly, you, you as an organization. Um, if you're going to look into that, you got to partner with your IT folks um, and you got to really get into an understanding, you know, if you're going to integrate that into your, your access control, um, are you going to integrate, do some integrations into your current, um, your, um, what your, your camera monitoring systems are, you know, are you going to do some standalone monitoring and uh, on, on standing of itself? Um, when we looked into this and we started doing this assessment, we started looking at what type of integrations, what kind of platforms, what kind of tools and resources, and we got a gambit of a lot of different options. And so we had to do a full assessment and review on it. Um, and you know, are you going to put turnstiles in? Um, are you, you know, are you going to do? There's there's discrete methods and there's different types of um, and. There's a lot out there, um, and so I would recommend if you're going to get into it, you know, go with an RFP, engage perhaps maybe even an architect, um, because a lot of times you're going to have to change your flow. You're going to get have to probably engage some kind of life safety review um, because you're going to change be changing your egress, your ingress changes. Um, you still have to. You can't. You know, life safety is going out. We, or security professionals, we know this. Life safety trumps security. Um, we still have to allow people out to freely egress, um, and so we have to, you know, have those means and methods. And so, um, you know, there's there's lots of technology. The technology is getting smaller. It's getting more accessible. But uh, it, there, I, I, I know I've kind of dodged the question, but everybody's different. Everybody's unique. You're gonna have to really do an assessment. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you. Yeah. And then uh, we have one more question, and I think Rob, uh, I think you and I both can touch on this one here. Um, and the question is, uh, we have many hospitals that interpret regulations differently, um, and they feel that the security officers can't touch the pa patient. So the question is, is who can we work with at the state to partner on common understanding across our system? Um, you know, for that, you know, my recommendation is, you know, uh, you work with your Department of Public Health. Uh, you know, like California, where, where I'm located, is California Department of Public Health. They're the ones that are going to be serving your facilities. I would work directly with them on these issues you know, to help provide guidance on, you know, how to how to handle, uh, you know, future, you know, future, um, you know, incidents specifically with security. Um, you know, because there are times where security is going to have to use soft control methods, you know, even our, you know, hand control methods to, to be able to control a patient, you know, that's out, that's out of control, or that you know, at times. And it's a chemically reduced behavior where they don't even realize what they're doing. So, uh, Rob, do you uh, you you want to touch on that a little bit as well on on who to work with? Yeah, I think that where where kind of the misnomer, I think where people can get sideways and where the regulatory issues come in play is the use of law enforcement technique. Um, and from the regulatory side of thing is on a patient um, and, and the, the, from the regulatory side of assessment from especially a clinical review um, from a um, CMS type survey from a Department of Health and Senior Services, um, they're looking at it from an abuse and neglect type of thing and their assessment is it's a clinical intervention, it's a clinical environment, clinical care. The clinician has the authority. It's in their cl the, their clinical license. They are the authority at that time. Um, and as we as security professionals are under their guise and authority, and we are supportive of them, and we must use clinical tech techniques. Um, if we have uh, equal or same training, um, there's all kinds of tools. There's all kinds of training out there. Um, CPI is one. There's all, you know, that's one you hear a lot of. Um, there's all different ones out there. Um, it's whenever the term law enforcement techniques is thrown out there, and, you know, that's when um, those uh, DHSS type and, and uh, surveyors get a little sideways. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Okay. Well, uh, well yeah, thanks again, Rob. And I think that's uh, for. For uh, we're done with our questions. I, I don't see any more in the queue. Um, so that's going to be the end of today's topic. Um, I want to thank Rob and Buck for your time today. Uh, gr granted, I, like I said, this is great information presented that we all benefit from. You know, we had a lot of specialized uh, aspects with this webinar, and we really appreciate your time today. 
So our next webinar is going to be in two weeks. Uh, we got a great lineup uh, next webinar as well. We're going to have speakers specifically from DNV and CIHQ and myself, and we're going to be giving our projections on the 2022 regulatory changes, so you're not going to want to miss it. A uh, couple reminders is you're going to receive an email with a link to future webinars, and we also encourage you to share this information with your colleagues and tell them about our webinars. Like we said earlier, we want to see this network grow. So go to Solarin.com at Think Tank to check it out and watch our other webinar recordings for great tips. And we even have a few available for ASHI CECs. So in staying with today's topic of security, I want to remind you Solarin has many software solutions specifically designed for healthcare by facilities directors and surveyors by myself, like myself. Uh, the security manager suite, as Ray talked about, we've got four apps that are all built in, go from incident tracking to managing all the way up to automating officer rounds. So scan the QR code on the screen to learn more about, you know, all the security manager suite does for your facility, and we'd love to talk to you more about it. Um, also, our vendor manager, manager suite, it also fits, fits really well with today's topic, too. And this suite specifically has applications designed to manage you know, communication with vendors, contractors, you know, automatic approvals and credentialing management. Um, so this is also a game changer for your facility. So uh, utilize the QR code up, that's up on the screen as well. And these are all designed to make your facility compliant, seamless, seamless and uh, efficient. So we'd love to give you a quick overview of what these solutions, solutions look like and could do a complement you know, with your facility management. So scan the QR code and get in touch with us. Like I said, we'll be more than happy to walk you through it. So in closing, we want to encourage you to use Facility Compliance Think Tank Q&A and the group on LinkedIn uh, also to get any additional questions answered by industry e experts. And we want to remind everyone that this is an area to interact with other professionals in the field and our panel of experts. Specifically, specifically, our panel of experts today will also be included with this group as well. So that concludes today's webinar. Salerno and our speakers would like to thank you for joining us and we look forward to seeing you next time. Have a good day.